What's up gang, Todd here, and it's finally time for part two to the 2009 Mac Pro 12 core upgrade. If you remember back to part one and at the end of the video how the machine was rebooting constantly whenever the CPUs were stressed, uh, I fixed that issue before the video was ever actually uploaded. However, I held off on doing this part two until I had a chance to work with the machine some more. What I found was on one of the heat sinks, uh, heat sink number, I think it's A is how it's phrased, CPU A, I think is how it's phrased on the Mac Pro. Uh, what I found was one of the bolts wasn't tightened down all the way. Uh, I was actually turning the bolt after about taking it apart two or three times and one of the bolts I turned, turned and all of a sudden I heard a click and I thought, oh shit, I thought I broke something. Because those actual heat sink, um, those heat sinks themselves have captive screws. So the screws are captive down in them. And you can't remove them. So if you break off a screw, uh, you've pretty much got to replace the whole heat sink. And each of those heat sinks is $250, $300 each. So if you screw up a screw in one of them or break something else in the CPU or in the heat sink, like uh, screw up a fan or something like that, uh, you got to replace the whole damn thing. And it's extremely expensive. Uh, so I continued turning and then it tightened down. I thought, well, okay, maybe it just didn't catch. Booted the machine back up and it was perfect. It, it could handle anything I threw. I could run stress tests for hours on end and the machine would get loud as hell, cooling itself down, of course, but it would stay stable. So basically what happened was one of the CPU heat sinks wasn't completely flush down on top of the CPU. Uh, I guess it was, and you couldn't tell if you held the CPU board at an angle and looked at the heat sink on the board because of the way it covers over top of the CPU, uh, the way it shrouds it on top of it, you couldn't tell it wasn't completely flush. So that was uh, pretty nice that I could fix it that way. I just tightened the, the screws down and it you know, fixed itself. The final configuration of the machine included a Gigabyte R9 280X 3 Gigabyte video card. Um, this is, if you're interested in AMD side of things versus NVIDIA, the R9 280X is, is probably about as high as you can go on the um, AMD side that's supported in the Mac Pro currently, uh, as far as driver-wise. The, the video card's very, very, very similar to the uh, video cards that are in use in the uh, little cylinder Mac Pro uh, that's currently in the market. It's a very similar video card. Uh, it's very fast, great open seal acceleration for Apple's uh, professional applications like um, Final Cut. Uh, they utilize OpenCL acceleration versus OpenGL. So actually, when you use Final Cut, it's faster to use an AMD card than an NVIDIA card. You could use a $250 AMD card to get better performance in Final Cut than a $1,000 NVIDIA card. So that's why I used that. Uh, of course, I had 48 gigabytes of RAM machine. I had the USB 3 card you saw in the previous video. Uh, I ended up putting in two uh, the Samsung 850 Evo 500 gig um, solid state drives. One was a boot drive, one was an editing drive. They were attached to one of those Apricorn Velocity Duo X2 cards. I replaced, I had a Solo X2, or Solo, yeah, Solo X2 card in the machine initially, and I took it back, got the Duo X2, which allows you to put two of those Samsung uh, SSDs on one um, card and put them in the machine in the PCI Express slot. So I got mad fast SATA 3 uh, acceleration on the, um, SSDs instead of being limited to SATA 2. However, with all that said, I actually sold the machine around Thanksgiving, which I know is going to come to shock to some of you, and some of you are going to be pissed that I didn't have a chance to further film the machine, but I'll, I'll explain to you what happened with it. With my move to working with 4K video, I noticed the machine simply wasn't cutting it. The video I shot the machine with was my old uh, Sony Alpha 5100, which was a 1080p camera, and it edited 1080p footage, you know, no problem. I could throw layers of 1080p footage on there, effects on them, color grade it, you know, yada, 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 whatever. It was no problem. However, when I started dropping 4K footage in there, especially if there was more than one clip of us star stacking 4K videos in there, uh, yeah, it would, just, it would lag and sometimes it would, I wouldn't say it would drop frames, but it would stutter and more importantly, the export times, whenever I export video out of it, it simply wasn't utilizing all of the cores, uh, even rendering, let's say if I was rendering effects and stuff like that, it just wasn't utilizing all the cores very fast. Plus being an uh, older CPU architecture, even though each core ran at 3.33 gigahertz, the thing is it didn't run as fast as a modern CPU with a similar clock speed and it's simple as that. If you use things like Handbrake, which would utilize basically every single CPU resource you have, then yeah, you would have no problem running the, those dual core CPUs completely to tilt. I mean, you would you can completely pick out all 12 cores and actually the room would get noticeably hotter because hell, it's pumping out a lot of heat out of that machine. That was actually one of the problems also with that machine. Late summer, when I built it, and the damn room would get like uncomfortably hot sometimes. I'd have to keep the doors open, keep the fan going. Uh, and if, here in the winter time, that wouldn't be a bad thing, but right now, the, the damage, uh, yeah, here in winter, it wouldn't be bad, but during, um, 
summer, oh man, we're gonna get just hot as hell from it. And the machine wasn't utilizing what I had available to it. So I decided to sell the machine off and do something a little different. After I sold the machine off, I picked up a late 2014 uh, Mac Mini, you know, which is definitely not an editing beast by any length of imagination. It was a 2.6 gigahertz, I believe, i5, dual core i5 with eight gigs of RAM. I simply used that for a couple weeks to be able to work on some videos and have a you know, computer while I decided what I wanted to do with um, my main machine. And after looking around, pricing out some different Macs, I looked at the Mac Pro, the cylinder Mac Pro, and how much it cost to build up one of those where I wanted. I looked at the new iMac, because I was happy with my previous iMac, but I needed some you know, beefier for video, for 4K video especially. And the new Skylake i7 I iMac, uh, 27 inch with the AMD R9, uh, R9 385, I think. I think that's what it is, 395? Ah, it doesn't matter. Uh, that thing's a beast with 4K. Actually, it slaughters under most circumstances. You look at benchmarks, it just pounds the current Mac Pro cylinder in the ground. There's some scenarios where that machine's actually faster, uh, but under most, for video editing, the iMac's actually faster because of its newer CPU architecture with i7 CPUs, which have acceleration for um, video encoding and stuff like that so it actually is faster than the Mac Pro unless you put it under some extremely heavy loads then the Mac Pro is faster but under most you know consumer level loads the, you know the IMAX is a faster machine uh, I looked at that but I, you know I don't want to spend there three thousand dollars on a machine that has limited upgrade potential uh, you can upgrade to RAM and that's that's about it everything else is external I didn't want that. I wanted something that had a little more uh, modular upgradability to it. And that really only left one upgrade path, and that was a Hackintosh. And you could probably judge by the title, that's what I've done. I've moved from my Mac Pro over to a Hackintosh. Uh, this isn't my first rodeo with a Hackintosh. Uh, years ago, I used one before I bought my iMac. I'd, had, I'd been using one, and I was happy with it. And then I bought my iMac to replace that. So, you know, I'm familiar with the Hackintosh process, and I know the pitfalls and the follies and things to look for. Uh, most important thing when you're building a Hackintosh is to make sure you buy hardware that's uh, supported. Uh, probably one of the best websites for people that are beginning in the Hackintosh scene is Tony Mac X86. And I'll, link a, I'll leave a link down in the description for you. Uh, but the website has an absolute wealth of knowledge uh, as far as getting a machine up and running with a vanilla image, which that's important because you don't want to use hacked kernels. You want, you want an image that's as close to an original OS 10 image on a, on a Mac as you can get. You want it to be as vanilla as possible. Original kernel, original drivers, software, stuff like that. So it runs, performs, and acts just like a real Mac. You don't want something like one of these hacked versions that runs on AMD's CPUs. You don't want to run one of those. Those things are just junk. Those are compatibility nightmares. You don't want one of those. So you want, a you want an image that will perform and work just like it does on a real Mac. So you want to use an Intel-based CPU, Intel-based chipset, and there's some other things you want to look for, but their website can explain that out for you. The configuration I built includes a white NZXT H440 case, a Gigabyte Z97X Gaming 7 motherboard, a, I used another R9 280X video card. Uh, I sold the Gigabyte one with my Mac Pro, but I, bought, I picked up a Sapphire VaporX, uh, one for the new Hackintosh, and it uses an Intel 4790K quad core 4 gigahertz CPU, 32 gigabytes of crucial memory, as a Corsair CS650 650 watt power supply to power the whole rig. And finally for storage, I have a 250 gig Samsung 850 Evo um, M.2 SSD in the motherboard, which it's supported, no problem. And then I have another 500 gig uh, 850 Evo on the SATA 3 port for storage for Final Cut editing projects. I edit straight on the SSD instead of using any kind of hard drive based storage. So you're probably asking yourself, well, how does it perform compared to the 12 core? Well, generally speaking, it smokes the doors off the 12 core. If we run Geekbench on the machine, uh, Geekbench 3, the 12 core machine scores a measly 2,700 points per CPU, single threaded, but a whopping 31,000 for multi-thread. So it really, really takes advantage of multi-threading. If we look at the Hackintosh, it's the exact opposite. It lays down a whopping almost 4,500 points per core, single threaded, However, only about 17,000 and some for multi-threaded. So uh, for multi-threaded applications, obviously things that really take advantage of multi-threaded, obviously the Mac Pro is going to be a lot faster, but for single thread applications, which the majority of your software that we run, games and video editing software, stuff like that, things that don't really take advantage of every single CPU resource, uh, yeah, the Hackintosh is a hell of a lot faster. And then Cinemage R15 from Maxon. That's another very popular benchmark, uh, especially among Max users. 
Uh, PC Windows users, they don't really look at it much. It's there, but they don't really look at it too much. But on the Mac side, it's something that's very popular. And I've got some notes here. I can't remember these numbers straight off the top of my head, uh, but I'll go ahead and recall them here. Um, the 12 core machine doing the OpenGL, which is kind of like a um, graphics benchmark on this machine, running a car through the streets and stuff, it's 3D benchmark, uh, scores 66 frames per second during that benchmark, and then 1550 points for the CPU. So it, it can stress out during its rendering for the CPU stress. It takes all 12 cores and completely maxes them out. So it gets a really nice 1550 points for the CPU. The Hackintosh absolutely pounded the 12 core to the uh, ground with 126 frames per second. Uh, exact same kind of video card, running at the same resolutions, they scored double the frame rate. Uh, so that's a, that's a pretty big uh, difference, especially considering they're running the same video card. The only difference is, you know, CPU architecture, motherboard, PCI Express, um, speed, stuff like that, but the uh, Hackintosh just walked all over it. However, it only scored 870 points for a CPU, so you know four cores being stressed out versus the 12. So obviously it's not going to be as fast and multi-threaded application. So if you do 3D rendering and stuff like that, yeah, the 12 cores will be a faster machine. And then finally, Bruce X. Uh, if you're not familiar with Bruce X, Bruce X is a benchmark that a lot of guys use in Final Cut. Basically, it's a 5K timeline with uh, a bunch of effects littered throughout it. It doesn't have any video, in it. it's just basically a 5K timeline with a whole bunch of different effects in it. Uh, what that'll do is test the rendering speed. It doesn't really test the export speed, but test the rendering speed uh, inside of Final Cut. And this is where a heavy OpenCL acceleration really helps. This is why you see like these um, the new trash can cylinder max really excel at this because they have dual AMD view cards in them so they can really take advantage of it. And looking at the benchmarks on the 12 core, I could do the Bruce X in about 22 seconds. However, on the Hackintosh, I can do that in about 15 and a half seconds. So there's a notable, noticeable increase uh, in speed, uh, about 25% faster. And if I drop in another AMD video card in this Hackintosh, I can drop it down a few more seconds. So, uh, you know, I, I can keep dropping video cards in this as long as I have the power supply for it. And each one will just add extra open seal compute speed. So when I'm rendering video in Final Cut, it's even faster. However, it won't really affect the, the final export speed, which this machine's faster exporting than 12 core was too. Well, that brings us around to one of the last parts of the video, and that's would I recommend a 12 core Mac Pro um, for a person? Um, really, that kind of depends on what you're doing with it and depends on if you already own the machine. If you already own a 2009, 2010, 2012 Mac Pro, if you already own the machine, especially if you own a dual core or dual processor rather machine, would I recommend upgrading it? Sure. If you already have the hardware, uh, you can spend a couple hundred dollars or so, depending on which configuration hardware you have. Upgrade the CPU, uh, upgrade your RAM if you need to, video card. Yeah, you can still do that stuff and keep it within a couple hundred dollars budget, you know, de depending on where you're at. Uh, maybe four, five, six hundred dollars. You know, it just depends. And also, if, if you need a lot of CPU bandwidth, if you need a lot of multi core, multi threaded performance, then sure, the 12 core dual six core upgrade makes sense. However, with that said, if you don't already own the machine, if you're looking to buy this machine for the first time like I was, you know, I didn't have one, I had to buy the machine. It was about $1,000 to buy the base dual CPU quad core. And then I put another five or so hundred dollars and five or six hundred dollars in the CPUs, another 250 or so in video card, RAM, SSDs, yada, yada, yada. By the time I was in it, uh, into the machine, I was probably a solid uh, $2,000, $2,200 in the computer. In that case, was it worth it? Not even close to it. Um, it was faster than my iMac, for example, in export speed and in rendering, but not by a whole lot. Uh, and to be honest, the general smoothness inside the OS, just moving around the operating system, opening menus and just uh, things like that, to be honest, the IMAX felt a little faster and the Hackintosh certainly felt a hell of a lot faster than that machine. So if you have an existing machine you want to upgrade it, sure, the 12 core upgrade or even high end quad core makes, dual quad core makes sense. If you're buying the machine for the first time, unless you can really stress and utilize all 12 cores, I just don't think it's worth it for the average consumer. Well guys, I think that about wraps up this video. Please consider subscribing and leaving me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. And don't forget to leave a comment below if you have anything to say. Uh, maybe you think the Hackintosh was a good idea. Maybe you think I should have stuck with the 12 core Mac or maybe 
looked at a different machine altogether, feel free to leave a comment below. I'm, I'm sure we're gonna have some people that are gonna be vocal about the fact that I sold off the Mac Pro and replaced it with what they consider an inferior Hackintosh, but for my usage, my, my usage patterns, it's a perfect machine. Anyways, guys, I'll check out you guys in the next video.